Hello, welcome. Uh, today we are going to discuss a very good paper by Richard Legro, who has published a New England Journal of Medicine. And this paper looks at, in the treatment of polycystic ovarian syndrome, which drug is better to induce ovulation, letrozole or clomiphene? Again, this is a review that we do once a week of interesting papers that gives us an insight into which drugs or which methodology is better. Now, what is clomiphene? Clomiphene or clomid, it is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. And what does it do? It antagonizes the negative feedback of estrogen in the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus thinks that there's no estrogen and it starts increasing its gonadotrophins and FSH. A very unique and a beautiful concept that can work. Now there are some drawbacks with clomiphene. Uh, these drawbacks are from the center. Now this was a study which Richard Legros team did in the past and they noticed a few drawbacks. The live birth rate after a cycle of clomid, about five or six cycles, is 22%. There's a three to eight percent multiple pregnancy rate and there are undesirable side effects. Clomiphene, in fact, causes more mood changes and hot flushes happens in almost 25% of patients. Now, other drugs are also evaluated. Metformin is one which is used extensively. And even today, there'll be people who will vouch about metformin based on studies which are no way linked to their local population, but will vouch for it. Now in that center, in Richard Legro center, metformin, either in combination or alone, was not superior to clomiphene citrate. And that was their study. Aromatase inhibitors like letrozole blocks estrogen synthesis, a completely different pathway. It affects the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian function. So the pituitary then decides, hang on, there is less estrogen in the system, so let me start pushing in more FSH. There's an advantage to letrozole, it's more physiological. It has lesser side effects, and those of whom who have done my course will see that when you compare the clearance of clomiphene, letrozole clears much faster. Clomiphene has a, a very cumulative effect and its use of the cumulative effect can be used in different other treatment modalities. Now let's look at this study. 750 patients, 18 to 40 years, Polycystic ovarian syndrome by the modified Rotterdam criteria, at least one fallopian tube that is open, and a sperm which was 14 million per ml. The protocol, withdrawal bleed with Provera, 5 mg a day for 10 days, if needed, not always, clomiphene citrate, 50 mg, or letrozole, 2.5 mg, from days 3 for 5 days. A maximum of five cycles, a maximum dose of clomiphene of 150 milligram, and a maximum dose of letrozole of 77.5 milligram for five days. And this was if the first cycle did not work. Again, there was no trigger. Very important to remember. There was no trigger and there was no IUI. So there was sexual intercourse two to three times a week on a regular basis. And this is something which is very different. What are we looking at this study and what is it telling us? It's telling us that how effective would letrozole and clomiphene be if we do not do IUI and if we do not trigger ovulation. Let's look at the results. Clomiphene, 19.1% live birth rate, a pregnancy loss of 29.1% and spontaneous ovulation in 76.6%. Let's look at letrozole. 
a live birth rate of 27.5%, much higher than clomiphene, a pregnancy loss of 31.8%, and ovulation in 88.5%, which itself is a significantly large spontaneous ovulation. So just compare it with clomiphene and letrozole, you are more likely to get more spontaneous ovulation with Letrozole. Have a look at the Kaplan Mir chart, which will also show how significantly better letrozole is. Let's look at the side effects. Clomiphene had hot flushes in 33% of cases, while letrozole had it in 20.3% of cases. Now, the controversy of whether letrozole causes congenital abnormalities. In this study, it was 1.5% with clomiphene and 3.9% with letrozole. There has been a very large paper published, which I'll present at some later time, which gives a reasonable good evidence that letrozole is safe and does not increase the chances of having an abnormal baby. And that's will be presented later. And I believe in many countries, the ban on letrozole has hence been removed. Now, another question which is often asked is, why don't we use anastrozole? And this came up because when we started using letrozole and a ban came in many countries, people started moving to anastrozole. And because pharmaceutical companies want to push drugs, we end up believing in them. Now, there are two studies which compared anastrozole versus clomiphene. And both confirmed that anastrozole was less effective than clomiphene. In fact, we now know that letrozole has a greater suppression of aromatase than anastrozole and thus gives lower estrogen levels. Think again, what does a lower estrogen level do? It gives you a higher spike of FSH. So you can now understand why letrozole can be superior. There are a few points that we got from the study. Now, we still don't know how important those points are. With letrozole, there was lower estradiol and a higher progesterone level with estradiol. There's something different which I can't explain at present, but maybe it may have significance in the future, is looking at the luteal phase endometrium was thinner with letrozole. This is not follicular phase endometrium. Please remember. Another point is that withdrawal bleed does not have any negative effects. So if you decide to give withdrawal bleed, it's not going to negatively affect your stimulation. But the problem with any oral drug therapy, which is lower success rates compared to gonadotrophins, is that there's a high dropout rate. And that's one of the reasons why you will see many women dropping out of clomiphene or letrozole therapy. Now, in conclusion, letrozole is superior to clomiphene as a treatment of anovulatory infertility due to polycystic ovarian syndrome. It gives high live birth rates, but remember, it also gives high ovulation rates, spontaneous ovulation, and that is something which is very important to remember. Finally, thank you for listening. Again, this is an entirely free series of lectures which will go on as long as we want. There are close to 82 to 84 lectures which are posted online. If you wish to write and ask us questions, please email fertilitycourses at gmail.com with a full history. I cannot answer questions which are uh, single line questions or double line questions. If you do want to do a course, there's no way influenced by what you hear here or what you, this course is complete, this teaching is completely open to everyone. But if you want to do a course where you want to learn about different protocols, you want to learn about different protocols of Clomid, IUI or of IVF, then yes, I do conduct a course 
twice or thrice a year. This is run by the IBC and please email Anita at IBC. She'll give you more information. I do not, I'm not the organizer of this course. I lecture on that course. I hope that you will get more involved. If any of you wants to present at, on this site, please drop me a, a Dropbox link and I will, without fail, have a look at the lecture and host it. The more of us who get involved, we will improve the quality of education we provide. And in the end, if you can't share education, edu education has limited meaning. Thank you.